Thank you so much. Thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. And uh, thank you also to the chairman for his warm welcome to this beautiful region. I've only been here a few hours and mostly been stuck inside, but uh, I can see why it's getting named to be a tourism uh, magnet. I think that's great. So good luck with that. I'm really delighted to be back in Georgia. My last visit was just about this time last fall and the warmth of the Georgian um, welcome. It's legendary, but I've experienced it a number of times and it's always a pleasure to be back here. I'm particularly pleased. This is my first time in Batumi. I've never been here before. And uh, with all our NATO allies, we've been uh, enjoying it this afternoon and really uh, quite pleased to have this opportunity. Tomorrow we will be going to view uh, your uh, Coast Guard vessels and talking to some of the crews that NATO's been cooperating to train. Uh, and I think that will be really a good opportunity as, uh, as we've already heard mentioned to talk more about NATO in Georgia and Georgia in NATO. Those are our watchwords that, that we live by every day when we work on our cooperation with your country. I'm also delighted to be here to launch NATO Days. Uh, it's an exciting program of, of events. Uh, and it will go on, just uh, as said, throughout October to show how NATO and Georgia are working together to improve Georgia's defense capabilities and to pave the way to your eventual membership in NATO. So they're very important for a number of reasons, but I hope you'll take full advantage of, of the events that will be unfolding over the next month. This visit in and of itself demonstrates the ongoing importance of our relationship and our commitment to strengthening our cooperation. Wherever I go, I always try to make time to speak to uh, students, to university students, because I need to hear from you about what you're thinking about the future of the security environment and the defense challenges that you will face, as well as your aspirations for, uh, for the future and, and what you think is going to be most important. Clearly, NATO is a defense alliance, no question about it, so we focus on defense and security but I'm interested to hear what your concerns and priorities are as well, even beyond the defense world. In Georgia, and here in Batumi in particular, I think you can see the difference that a generation can make because I understand and looking at the beautiful, you know, seafront and the way there's been so much growth and development, I can see that indeed uh, a generation has made a difference. So that's really the message I wanted you to take away with you today that each and every one of you has tremendous power to make a change for the future. Now, let me talk for a little bit about NATO's enduring partnership with Georgia. Our unique partnership dates back almost 30 years, long before many of you were born, and it is only increased in depth and in breadth. NATO leaders have consistently reiterated their decision from Bucharest in 2008 that Georgia will become a member of NATO. We know that this matters to Georgia. It matters to you. It matters to your families. It also sends a strong message that no country has the right to interfere in or decide another country's destiny. Russia's repeated disregard for international law and the values that underpin it will not deter us from working closely with Georgia. It has only made our resolve and our relationship stronger. NATO continues to call on Russia to withdraw its troops from Abkhazia and South Ossetia. These territories are part of Georgia. We will never recognize them as anything else. We condemn the grave human rights violations, militarization, and construction of border-like obstacles and barbed wire fences. We commend national efforts to reduce tensions through your steps in the um, through your Steps to the Future program and other measures that Georgia is taking to negotiate also a, a peaceful resolution and improve the everyday lives of Georgians in those regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Today at our NATO Georgia Commission meeting, which we just finished, uh, allies around the table spoke to commend Georgia for your restraint and for your pragmatic approach to trying to continue to advance the peace process and make a difference in the lives of those citizens living in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Let me talk now about our strong framework for cooperation. NATO supports Georgia through a range of political and practical measures. 
The NATO Georgia Commission, that's what's brought us here to Batumi, has provided the framework for our cooperation since 2008. NATO's liaison office uh, in Tbilisi offers practical support and guidance to the government and to civil society on the ground. I hope you're already following them on Facebook, but if you're not, I highly recommend it. They're, uh, they're really great, and they have a lot to say about NATO's cooperation with Georgia and Georgia's cooperation with NATO. Through Georgia's annual national program, we provide practical advice on both military and civilian aspects of reform. And this, this year, we are celebrating five years of the substantial NATO Georgia package, which is helping to strengthen Georgia's defense capabilities and resilience and our ability to work together. So what does all this mean concretely? Experts from NATO allies and partners are on the ground every day, providing training and advice on everything from cyber threats to crisis management, from aviation to training of your special forces. Our Joint Training and Evaluation Center, which is just outside of Tbilisi, is the, uh, it's the centerpiece of our substantial package of cooperation. It offers joint training and exercises between Georgia and NATO allies and partners. And by the way, just this last March, I was really happy about this because the JTEC, as we call it, the Joint Training and Evaluation Center, JTEC, has really gone from strength to strength in recent years. And what was so important about the NATO Georgia exercise last March is that it was Georgian led and Georgian planned from beginning to end with the JTEC taking the lead in doing that. And that's a very important step forward in the defense, uh, the defense planning process. Earlier this year, uh, I mentioned that we had this joint training exercise in March, and it actually brought 24 NATO allies and partners together as well. So it wasn't only you know, Georgia per se, but it was truly Georgia plus NATO. We are stepping up our support now, as I mentioned a moment ago, to the Georgian Coast Guard. NATO wants to ensure that the uh, Black Sea remains a source of stability and security for NATO allies, but also partners. We also heard today uh, at our NGC meeting from your neighbor Turkey and also Bulgaria and Romania with some very strong comments about the necessity of sustaining and building, strengthening uh, security for all in the Black Sea uh, because they are NATO members and also littoral states here around the Black Sea. And so your security and their security is important to us all. Let me talk a little bit more about Georgia's com contributions. Georgia is a small country but your standing on the global stage is great. Your armed forces are renowned for their dedication and professionalism. By the way, just like your rugby team, um, you know the US lost yesterday to France at the Rugby World Championships in uh, Japan. I understand uh, your team lost today to Fiji, but you're still in the game, and uh, I know that uh, the Georgian team are strong fighters, so I really wish them best of luck for their, uh, their next round with uh, Australia next week. You're not out of it yet. I don't know about the US, we may be out of it, but we'll, we'll leave that go. Anyway, Georgians have made a tremendous contribution to NATO and EU-led uh, EU missions and operations. Georgia is the largest non-NATO contributor to NATO's training mission in Afghanistan. And by the way, uh, you now have uh, a Brigadier General serving as the Deputy Chief of Staff uh, at the uh, RSM mission, the Resolute Support Mission in Afghanistan, and taking the lead on the Train, Advise, and Assist mission. And I think that's another sign of uh, Georgia's leadership as a partner of NATO, and truly, we really appreciate it. I will say also, though, that we appreciate further that the Georgian um, people have paid the ultimate price in Afghanistan with 29 of your young people lost there. So we also acknowledge and recognize that and constantly remember that you are truly making a huge contribution to our joint operations and missions. Georgia is participating in NATO's response force also, enhancing our ability to deploy wherever and whenever we are needed. And Georgia is committing to spending 2% of its gross domestic product on defense, including 20% of that amount to modernize its forces. 
This is what we call the Defense Investment Pledge inside NATO, and uh, we are driving hard to make sure that all NATO allies get to that goal by 2024, but you are already doing it, and we appreciate that very much. We recognize the enormous contributions and sacrifices the Georgian people have made for our shared security. Georgia has made substantial progress in modernizing your defense forces and building stronger defense institutions. First and foremost, this helps you to better defend your own country, and that's at the core of the matter. It also enables you to make valuable contributions to wider regional and global security. It's a virtuous circle, as we say, a virtuous circle. Greater security helps to consolidate democracy and boost economic development. And in turn, a robust society and economy helps to strengthen your sovereignty and territorial integrity. This does not mean that there are not serious challenges ahead for Georgia. Reform of the judiciary, control of law enforcement, media freedom, free and fair parliamentary elections. We want to uh, see that coming up in 2020. All of these will be key, but again, NATO is ready to work with you on all of these goals. Georgia's partnership with NATO contains all the political and practical tools necessary to enable membership when the conditions are right. Georgia must continue to pursue the necessary reforms so that when NATO allies are ready to take the next step in the political process, Georgia is also ready. Continuing the pace of reform and realizing Georgia's Euro-Atlantic ambitions will be a societal and a generational challenge. This process will require hard work and patience, which is perhaps a luxury that only comes with age. Change may not come overnight, but we have seen what can happen in a generation. And as I said, we can see that right here in Batumi. But in every moment of adversity, there is always opportunity as well. In order to seize these opportunities, we will need your minds, the very best minds and talents, your talents. So as I said at the beginning, Never under, underestimate your potential to make a difference. You need to, as I do, think about how we can think big and build the future. But you're right at the beginning of your careers, your lives, and I see huge opportunities for you to think big and make a difference. So thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Very detailed analysis of NATO Georgia cooperation. Yes, uh, our cooperation uh, goes uh, many, many years ago, and we've achieved a lot of success in Georgia today at the highest level of interoperability, and especially when it comes to the military to military cooperation. And just recently, General Breedlove uh, emphasized that during his opening remarks at one of the big functions that was held. In, uh, in Georgia. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions, uh, Georgia-specific questions from the audience, but now I'd like to focus a little bit more on NATO and its defense and deterrence posture. Uh, none of us can imagine global peace and stability without NATO. NATO has been cornerstone of European and Euro-Atlantic security, and today NATO operates in a very unpredictable security environment, mostly created by aggressive actions from the Russian Federation. Its annexation, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, of invasion, occupation, annexation of Georgia and Ukraine, its hybrid warfare and elements, cyber attacks on the NATO allies, everything represents a significant threat and challenge to, the, to NATO. And NATO came up with the robust policies and decisions starting from Wales. And as you very precisely coined during your remarks at Brussels, forum, if I'm not mistaken, big arc of effectiveness. So three key milestones, Wales, uh, Warsaw, and uh, Brussels. So these decisions significantly strengthened NATO's defense and deterrence posture. Can you talk a little bit about it? Thank you. Absolutely. I call it the big arc of effectiveness, but also uh, an important, uh, important watchword for NATO is uh, adaptability. It's uh, basically uh, the necessity to be able to respond to whatever the, the world may throw at us in terms of our needs uh, for deterrence and defense. 
In 2014, we call that uh, a real watershed year for NATO because in that year, we saw the rise of Daesh and uh, you know the emergence of uh, the caliphate established in Mosul. And that was a real wake-up call. And that uh, led to a re-emphasis on uh, the counterterrorism mission in NATO, a, a real focus on that necessity, although we had and have been fighting terrorism at its core from practically from 9-11, when Article 5 was invoked for the first time in the United States, uh, thanks to, uh, not thanks to, but because of the attack on the United States. Uh, in addition to which, of course, that was the year uh, when uh, Russia seized Crimea and destabilized the Donbass. I absolutely agree with you that uh, this process started in 2008 here in Georgia with uh, the, the uh, Russian uh, so-called declaration of the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia with their insertion of uh, further military forces into those, into those regions. So we've had uh, not only a terrorist threat to contend with, but uh, a threat also that called forth the necessity of more attention once again to our mutual defense. And so in uh, Wales first in 2014, we put in place the decisions uh, that led to our initial uh, very high readiness joint task force, our ability to try to get some forces uh, into place rapidly uh, when they, uh, and should they be needed. And so that was an initial response. Moving on to the Warsaw Summit in 2016, we made the decision to deploy four battle groups in the three Baltic states and in Poland. And this is uh, by no means a force that's able to defend should there be uh, a Russian uh, invasion or a Russian attack, but it is a tripwire. And it's a, a tripwire because these battle groups involve units from all over the alliance, from all the way down south in Albania to all the way up north in Norway. And so if there should be an attack, the attacker knows that he's engaging not only the Baltic states and Poland, he is engaging the entire alliance. So that's why we call it a deterrence tripwire. Then coming uh, to our next summit meeting in Brussels uh, in 2018, we took the decision that we really had to work and work hard on reinforcement, on being able to bring further forces uh, to bear should there again be an attack on NATO. And NATO had not done this uh, for many, many years, bringing forces across the Atlantic from the United States, from Canada, bringing forces from across uh, the alliance to, uh, to reinforce, should it be necessary, and to reinforce rapidly. That means a lot of work on uh, not only on the, uh, having the troops available to reinforce, but making sure they are ready. And so now we have something going on, we're calling the Readiness Initiative, which is really focused on ensuring that there's a culture of readiness throughout the alliance and that we are truly ready should, uh, should we be faced with uh, a crisis or heaven forbid, with a conflict. So we have moved, uh, I think, well to adapt over these years, but there's still a huge amount to be done. And by the way, we learn from our partners. Uh, you mentioned how we are facing hybrid cyber attacks. Absolutely, yes, many, many. But we are learning from our partners, uh, such as Georgia, because Georgia, you've been facing these kinds of uh, threats now and these kinds of attacks for a long time. So. It's, as I see it, our partnership is a two-way street, and it has to be a two-way street. We have to learn from you as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I certainly don't want to abuse my position as a moderator and ask all the questions. So now I would like to open the floor uh, to the students to come up with their questions. But first, please identify yourself and keep your questions pretty short because we have some time constraints. So first. Yes. Hello, first of all, hello again. Uh, first of all, thank you for your attention. My name is Alexander Sharabitsi. I'm from Batumi State Maritime Academy. And I'd like to ask uh, nowadays, what's the exact, exact uh, obstacle for Georgia's integration into NATO? And uh, what, uh, then again, what uh, additional steps should Georgia take to successfully join uh, the alliance? Thank you. Shall I answer 
Councilman? Yes. yes. Okay. All right, very good. Um, I think the most important uh, steps for Georgia at this moment are related to the continuation of reforms. And this was a message all around the, the table today um, at, in our NATO Georgia Commission meeting that there's a necessity to continue uh, the reform process, uh, for example, judiciary reform, oversight of the security forces, uh, continued, uh, continued uh, work uh, to fight against corruption, development of uh, a free and open media. By the way, I'm glad we had a lot of uh, people from the media at our uh, MGC meeting today, and I'm welcoming their presence here today as well. But all of those, uh, all of those aspects are very, very important. And as I uh, also stressed in my, um, in my remarks, I think that the progress you're making on uh, defense reform has been very, very important because it is, uh, it is developing uh, the kind of partnership that makes it very clear for NATO members uh, exactly what, uh, what uh, strength uh, Georgia has, what role it can play in being a security provider. And that's very important for any decisions about NATO membership. Uh, is a country, this is actually part of the, the Washington Treaty, is a country a security, net security provider? And so I think everything Georgia is doing on the path to uh, defense reform is also developing uh, that, uh, that trend line and also developing uh, that view inside and among NATO members. Because the last thing I have to say is, uh, you know, yes, uh, the Washington Treaty says NATO membership is open to European countries who are security providers. But it also says that all NATO countries must agree. So it's important also to work toward that consensus among NATO members. And that's, uh, that's an important way to go about it, to continue along the path of reform, including defense reform, and to build up the view among NATO members that Georgia is indeed a security provider. Thank you. More questions? Uh, yes, please. So, gentlemen in military uniforms are active, so we need more questions from uh, others, too. Hello, my name is Levan Varadashvili. I'm from Batumi Navigation Teaching University. And uh, I want to, to ask you uh, how... Uh, I will ask you later, okay? I will. <laughs> okay, no problem. And over there, I don't see, but yep. Please, can you give a mic? Hello. Sorry. Hello. Uh, my name is Salama Bubuteshvili from uh, Kutaisi Agrikiz Aritali State University. So my question will be about the, um, uh, the port of uh, Anaklia. So could you please tell us a little bit about that, and could you please tell us about the importance of an nuclear port and whether it will or not increase the, uh, the uh, importance of the country for uh, the organization, for the NATO itself? Could you tell me a little bit more about Anakli? Because I've read about it, but I don't really know at what stage the construction is and so forth. It's being developed as a, as a port, is that it correct? It is developing, we are told. Uh -huh. It is a project, it's a, it is a strategic project for Georgia. Uh, after that, we'll have a deep sea port, which uh, significantly improves our abilities to receive the big uh, ships and vessels, transport vessels, as well as military vessels. And needless to say, this is the must build project in Georgia. I see. Well, thank you for that clarification. Again, I read about it in the newspapers, but I wasn't quite sure at what uh, stage it was. I think, and I want to go back to the remarks I made, uh, because I talked about that virtuous circle. Uh, the more you have, uh, the more you have your security built up, uh, the more it contributes to economic health, and the more that economic health uh, can help to build uh, political strength and sovereignty. And so when I look at big projects of this kind, and, and I don't know a lot about the details of, of Anakli, there may be some nuances that I don't, I'm sure there are some nuances about it I don't understand, but I think it can be part of a virtuous circle to have such 
um, to have such uh, infrastructure projects underway that can help to uh, allow for your economic uh, development, can help to allow for a freer flow of commerce in and out of, of Georgia. That's important and in turn, as your economic health uh, continues to develop, and I know that there have been uh, good years of growth in the Georgian economy, but as your economic health continues to develop and your commerce links to the outside world, I understand also from our discussions today that you have uh, free trade agreements you know, with many important actors, both regionally and, and internationally, that all of this helps uh, in uh, strengthening your sovereignty uh, your independence, your, uh, your um, political um, uh, stability, and that in turn I think also is part of what builds up your defense and security uh, capacity and capability as well. So it's all part of a virtuous circle. I guess I'm not exactly commenting on Anakli per se, but in a more general sense that yes, good infrastructure development is needed. It's part of the economic health of a country, which in turn participates in its security and stability. Thank you for excellent answer on the questions. More questions? Uh, we have Han over there. Please pass the mic. Hello, I'm Kesa Vanilishi from Batumi Shotarustavali State University. It's a big honor for me to be here and have an opportunity to ask you a question. Uh, well, the model uh, for Georgia's membership in NATO, presented by Luke Coffey from Heritage Foundation and uh, General Secretary Rasmussen, calls it both the optimism and worry for the different part of the Georgian society. Um, how realistic is this implementation, um, uh, the implementation, and what is uh, the official attitude uh, of the aliens towards this scenario? Thank you. Uh, actually, this approach is not under discussion at NATO, and I mentioned again the importance of uh, continuing, as I call it, to keep our eye on the prize and continue to, to work on developing the reform processes here in NATO. Uh, I'm sorry, in NATO, of course, we have reform processes, but here in Georgia, to build up the reform processes and also to, uh, to continually work uh, to strengthen um, both uh, your defense, but also your, uh, your uh, security profile overall. So I think you know, it's really important, as I say, to keep, keep our eye on that prize, and that's where the NATO allies are focused as well. Yeah, this is, um, if I may just uh, add a little bit, uh, this was the uh, idea of uh, dear friends of Georgia. Luke Coffey was mentioned from Heritage Foundation, then previously the Atlantic Council from the United States also had this in their policy papers, and later uh, the former uh, Secretary General uh, Anders Fogh Rasmussen voiced during the McCain conference a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this uh, initiative uh, has the merit to be discussed, but of course, first and foremost, we have to discuss it internally and agree on it. And I personally for it 100% that this is the way how Georgia should move forward on its way towards NATO membership. and. I think it's a high time to start internal discussions on that, but again, it's uh, on Georgia and it's up to us and up to our government to launch intensive dialogue within the government as well as to consult with the public on this, uh, in my opinion, very, very precise and rational path towards NATO memberships. More questions? Could I just comment on that before I let, let this question go? I, as I said, it's not under discussion among NATO allies at, at headquarters. And indeed, um, I think, again, to recollect the point I made a little while ago, you need to think and think hard about uh, the best way to develop um, consensus among the allies on your membership path. So, you know, what's the best way to go about that? I, you know, it's in many ways going to be up to Georgia to decide that, but I do think uh, the necessity of developing uh, developing consensus should be always part of your considerations. Absolutely, absolutely so true. Questions from the audience? I see hand here, yes. Hello, my name is Mario Nende. I'm from University of Kutaisi. In 2008, there were, uh, there were a lot of uh, arguments about um, map of Georgia, but there was anything about it. Uh, so, my question is, do you think that by 
uh, granting map to Georgia would help help would have helped to um, sorry I'm nervous that's okay I can talk about map you, you can ask in Georgia and we can translate yes go ahead sorry no, it was a question about MAP, yeah, Membership yes, Action yes, Plan, uh, yes. and the 2008 yes. summit. Yeah, Georgia came up from the summit short of Membership Action Plan. Was it the right decision or wrong? Of course, it was a consensus-based decision, but from your perspective. Well, every uh, country aspiring to NATO membership um, comes through the process with, uh, with its own uh, you know, with its own particular path toward membership. So it's, you know, not necessarily uh, so that every, every country um, follows the same exact path, but MAP is an inherent part of the membership process, an integral part of it. There's no question about that. Nevertheless, Georgia has had an annual national program now for many, many years, and this annual national program has driven so much substantive, pragmatic pros, uh, progress that uh, it's truly impressive. And so I think, you know, that again, I, and we're getting to the point now we're going to be uh, renewing the ANP again, the Annual National Program again. And I think it's again an opportunity for Georgia to continue to, to move forward with your reforms. So. Um, I don't get so hung up on uh, MAP, no MAP. Others are asking ANP, no ANP. Uh, I don't need to get into too many details there, but, but the point is that every uh, country who is aspiring to NATO membership has, uh, has its own path in that direction. And your path with the ANP uh, being such an integral and uh, important part of it uh, has been so far uh, I would say very productive for, for Georgia's security overall. And at the end of the day, your defense and security is the most important concern for Georgia. Thank you very much. Uh, we you. have not talked about the Black Sea per se and the Black Sea uh, security and the NATO's measures. Uh, we see uh, NATO vessels entering in our ports. We see delegations visiting, but we all have an impression that it's not enough. So what more should we expect from NATO as NATO is uh, uh, projecting uh, concrete steps in support of the security and stability to this vital region for Euro-Atlantic security? I'm really, really glad that tomorrow we get to see the two uh, Coast Guard ships that have come from Poti to Batumi uh, and we'll have a chance to meet uh, the various uh, crews that we've been training for, uh, for boarding processes and procedures. Uh, to me, these kinds of maritime measures are very, very important, but I have a personal pleasure in seeing those ships tomorrow because when I was the Under Secretary of State, as you mentioned, that was my preceding job, we were um, looking at a small number of U.S. Coast Guard ships that were being declared um, excess to Coast Guard needs. And we were deciding, you know, which partners would get them. <laughs> and I was fighting for Georgia to get them. So I was very, very glad that, that they uh, came after they'd been refurbished uh, in Baltimore, that they came here to Georgia. And it's now part of your, uh, of your Coast Guard. They are now part of your Coast Guard. I continue, consider it a kind of personal victory. So I'm, I'm very glad I have the chance to see them tomorrow. We need to do uh, more of uh, these kinds of maritime measures. One thing we agreed today in the NGC, in the NATO Georgia Commission, is that we are going to um, refresh the substantial NATO Georgia package. That means we will be looking at new directions for cooperation, and I think, uh, and for building up different kinds of projects, but frankly, these maritime measures, which have really been agreed in the, in the past year, seeing uh, a rise in the kind of challenges, security challenges in the Black Sea following also the uh, Russian seizure of Crimea and their, their challenges to uh, freedom of navigation in the Sea of Azov area. So there, there are a number of reasons why we have been upping our attention to maritime measures uh, here in the Black Sea. 
Um, we have an opportunity through this process of refreshing the SNGP, Substantial NATO Georgia package, to look more at further maritime measures. So I, I know that will be on the agenda. It's something that will have to be, again, agreed with Georgia. You're going to have to decide what your priorities are. But from a NATO perspective, we think this is a, a good, good direction to proceed. Excellent. Thank you very much. More questions from the audience? Uh, I see hand over there. Uh, hello, my name is Hadia Goratskhelia. I'm from uh, Shotameskis, University of Zugdidi. So I would like to ask you one question. Uh, what should our country expect from London Summit, which will be held in December this year? Thank you very much for your attention. Very good question. But the first thing I have to say is it's not a summit. And that's an important point for you all to, to uh, hear because um, summit meetings are maybe two days long. There are many opportunities uh, to meet not only among allied leaders, but also with our partners. So for example, the Brussels summit in 2018, we had Georgia there. We put uh, in place a very important uh, statement agreeing certain new measures among the leaders. Very, very important. This meeting coming up in London in December, we're just calling simply a leaders meeting because there's only one working session and a dinner. That's it. And we're not meeting with any partners. So Georgia is not being singled out from that point of view uh, as far as the leaders meeting is concerned. But at the same time, we're going to have a very important platform in London called the NATO Engages uh, platform. It's a very large event where we are inviting all of our partners to send representatives to, at a high level to talk about your aspirations, to talk about your priorities, to talk about your objectives, and to really have an opportunity to speak on a world stage about Georgia and where you would like to go with NATO. So um, I did want to uh, put that out there. Just we've talked to the Georgian government about sending high-level representatives to uh, the NATO Engages events and event, and, and we think that will be an important opportunity. Thank you very much. Thanks. More questions? Uh, yes, we have hand over there. Please. Hello, uh, my name is Ani Gabelia, uh, a student from Shota Meskese Teaching University of Sukhdidi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for being here. That's very important for us. Uh, and I have one question for you. Uh, my question is, uh, to what extent uh, is the level of preparation of the Jordan army in line with NATO uh, with standards? Thank you for your attention. That's a very good question because uh, NATO interoperability, as we call it, interoperability is always a very important aspect um, of how we are able to work uh, together and also inside the alliance among the allies, interoperability is an important point as well as uh, following uh, NATO standards on everything from, from peacekeeping uh, to um, other kinds of military operations. So very, very important. And it's one of the things that we have been able to work on so much at the Joint Training and Evaluation Center, the JTEC, that I mentioned in, in my remarks. So George has made a huge amount of progress uh, in that regard, but uh, there is still work to be done. And uh, one of the things that now, I, I also mentioned in my remarks that you're spending 2% of GDP on defense, and of that amount, 20% should be spent on modernization, on acquiring new capabilities, on ensuring that your uh, equipment, this is the NATO Defense Investment Pledge, which uh, Georgia has embraced. Uh, so, you know, in a way, you're doing this voluntarily. I don't want to say you've, you've taken on an obligation or a commitment in the same way NATO allies do. But it's important also to think about that 20% investment in capabilities and, and what you need uh, to be interoperable, to be able to, uh, to work together with NATO. So how that money is spent is also a, a very, very important question. It's a question we ask allies every day as Georgia is volunteering in this regard. It's, as I said, not quite the same commitment, but, but we do really urge all our partners to think about interoperability of your equipment, uh, 
ways you train your soldiers, the standards that you follow, and uh, from our perspective, it's, uh, it's very important not only for our partnership, but also important for uh, the way that we think about participation in crisis conflict or peacekeeping. If I may, I want to take a moment with this question to talk about uh, our commitment to women, peace, and security and uh, defense of the rights of civilians in armed conflict. These kinds of um, principles are also extremely important. They're backed up by UN Security Council resolution, like Women, Peace, and Security, UN Security Council resolution 1325. So in working with our partners, we also like to ensure that there's this interoperability of, of values as well, and that we are working uh, also to advance the rights uh, of, uh, of women, working to ensure the security of civilians in armed uh, conflict, particularly protect women and children. So uh, there's also a kind of values aspect to this as well, and I wanted to say that Georgia has been an absolutely great partner working with us on UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and other related uh, issues. Uh, we, we really appreciate the, the partnership in this regard and, and your work on these issues. Oh, thank you very much, and I think I'll speak uh, on behalf of the audience here that we are proud of our men and women in uniform. Uh, they serve amazingly, especially overseas in hardship positions in Afghanistan. And as we speak, 870 Georgians are deployed in Afghanistan. And with your permission, I want to send all of our best regards to our troops in Afghanistan and also to American troops and NATO troops who, at the expense of their life, uh, they protect our peace and uh, stability. Absolutely. We have time for one last question, but keep it very short. But while we're waiting for one more hand to go up, we had a colleague over here who thought maybe he'd be asking a question after he thought about it a while. I don't know if yes. he's ready yet. <laughs> but, you, you can ask in Georgia and we can translate if you... But let me just join your comment, if I may, uh, for a moment about uh, Georgian troops in Afghanistan. We were just talking today at the NGC about how uh, Georgia for many years has been working with uh, the German lead nation up in mazar -e sharif in the north, and it was actually Georgian special operation forces who uh, helped to prevent serious, serious uh, damage to uh, the German facility there and perhaps loss of German lives in an attack last year. So I know that not only Germany, but also NATO as a whole really, really appreciates the contribution that Georgia has made to RSM whether we're talking about special operations forces or, or other contributions you have made. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll have one concluding question, if I may. Yes, go ahead. After you. I wanted to ask you uh, what's uh, the NATO's policy uh, uh, re regarding uh, the Plexi security and uh, how you see the NATO's role, uh, Georgia's role in it? It's uh, very important, I think, to continue to, uh, to build up our cooperation in this area. I mentioned that this can be a strong aspect, I think, of our uh, refresh of the substantial uh, NATO-Georgia package. And so we will be looking for other ways uh, beyond what we've done uh, so far to, uh, to really uh, build up our cooperation in this area. For example, I, I think, uh, situational awareness, maritime situational awareness will be an important uh, way that we can continue to work together. And, uh, you know, perhaps uh, we are intent on looking for better ways to share information. So I think that's an excellent area where I hope we can build up our cooperation. And my last question, uh, what is the best advice you can give to those students here uh, who would like to pursue their professional careers in diplomacy and international security affairs. What are the skills and qualities they need to develop and pay particular attention? Well, from what I've heard today, you have already uh, developed uh, one of the most important tools, and that is communication skills, because I congratulate you all on uh, really asking very excellent and articulate questions in English. 
I could not do it in Georgian. I apologize for that. But uh, in any event, that to me is the most important uh, goal to uh, go after if you are looking for a career in international diplomacy, to be able to speak other languages and to do it well. And that's really where I started my career at Georgetown University as a as a student in the School of Language and Linguistics. And uh, well, I studied Russian. Maybe I know that's not very popular around here, but <laughs> it's, it has served me well as a negotiator on uh, strategic arms uh, limitation and reductions. So uh, I make good use of it in in my work. Uh, but that's that's lesson number one. Another thing I like to tell young audiences uh, everywhere is never apologize. Oftentimes, if you're at a table uh, with people more senior than you are, you might start, maybe Georgians don't do it. You'll have to tell me, Misha, if this is the case or not. But uh, young people might start out by saying, uh, well, I'm not quite sure this is going to be right, or this might not be correct, but. And I had a very wise professor who said to me once, when I was apologizing like that, he said, never apologize. Just give your answer. Say what you need to say, put it out there, and if it's wrong, somebody will surely tell you, but you need to be able to speak clearly, not apologize, get your message out very, very uh, succinctly. And I think, to me, that was the best advice I ever got, um, in addition to being able to communicate. Thank you, what an inspiring answer, and uh, I wish I were a student listening to you right now. Uh, I think we had a great panel, and thank you very much for your excellent remarks. Thank you for being here in Georgia. Thank you for being friend of Georgia, and thanks for helping us with our goal to become a full-fledged member of NATO. And sooner it happens, better it will be for European and Euro Atlantic security. Please help me to give rounds of applause to NATO Deputy Secretary General. And, and the final element of our today's panel, uh, I would like to invite uh, Rector of Batumi State University to present a special book and a Georgian map with a NATO flag which was produced here in the Fab Lab of the University. Please.